In the fall of 1955, we moved from our rented carriage house on the Niagara Stone Road in Virgil to the other side of the Welland Canal to St. Catharines, nine miles away. In a brick house on 82 Albert Street. It was a nice change from living in the countryside to now moving to a city within walking distance of the library and movie theater. And I finally had my own bedroom. Of course, we were still renting. I continued going to the high school in Niagara Falls for my last year. It was easier academically and I drove with my dad each day to Niagara Lake where he was still working at Shepherd Boats and then took the school bus from there to the high school. Here is my grade 12 class photo. Niagara Falls, Ontario, spring 1956. I'm 18 years old in this photo. It's the summer of 1956, and it's time for our first television set. My friend Harry Vogt is holding the antenna, and my father is risking his life climbing down the roof. We now could watch the Lawrence Welk show, and on Sunday night, the Ed Sullivan show, and my parents' all-time favorite, the Billy Graham TV Crusades. The TV images were not that appealing. They were still in black and white, and I wasn't thinking of having a career in television. I had just seen Jacques Cousteau's beautiful underwater color film, The Silent World, in the local movie theater, and I was still interested in working in film. Right after I graduated from high school, I got a job with a local electric manufacturing company, first as a mill messenger, and then got promoted to work in an office sorting out timesheets. I was still dreaming of working in Hollywood someday and read that UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, was the place to learn and become a film cameraman. I had this crazy notion to apply to UCLA and to my surprise got accepted for the spring semester and was asked to show up the third week of January 1957. I very quickly realized that I didn't have enough money saved up. I don't remember how much the tuition or living expenses were at UCLA. But more importantly, that I lacked the courage and was simply not ready emotionally to leave home for California. Los Angeles was 2,500 miles away and a two-day bus ride. It scared me. Also, there was nobody I could turn to for advice and support or help me out financially. So I decided to stay in my own safe, secure environment in St. Catharines and California stayed a dream. I was terribly concerned and serious about what to do with my life. I didn't want to see my life slipping by. So I turned to the YMCA counseling service and got myself tested to find out what talents I had, what my prospects were, what professions to pursue. The YMCA was located on College Street in the center of Toronto. I went by bus and it was the first time I stayed in a hotel room overnight. The results showed an interest in the arts and no support for a career in engineering. Under abilities, they determined that my general mental skills were average, but I did very well in structural visualization, which is important in drafting assembly and layout, and my ability in discriminating art forms for composition and balance was excellent and rated in the top 10 percent. My interests were all concentrated in aesthetic and creative fields of work. It was suggested maybe to go to the Ryerson Institute in Toronto to study radio and television there or attend the Ontario College of Art. Good advice, 
I don't remember why I never contacted these places. Maybe the fact that I wasn't living in Toronto had something to do with it. My photographic vocabulary was limited to the photography annual brought out each year by popular photography magazine. And I always looked at the ads, especially the one showing the Rolleiflex camera. And finally, bought a used Rolleiflex from a local photo store. It was the first professional camera I owned. It was a twin lens, two and a quarter reflex camera made in Germany. I enjoyed using this camera and the photos were now sharp and of far better technical quality. And I used this camera for the next 15 years. Our family's only outing in the week was on Sunday when we attended the Christian Reformed Church service. Quite often, the service was held in the Dutch language. We never ate out, too expensive. My father was still working five and a half days a week, so we had little time off. Money was always in short supply in our family. And in order to buy a stove, a fridge, or a TV set, we had to borrow money from a finance company. Then there were the winters, long and dreary. To the north of St. Catharines was the big city of Toronto, the New York of Canada, only 70 miles away around the left bend of Lake Ontario. It was time to leave home, try my luck elsewhere, and see if I could change my life for the better. Again, I stayed at the now familiar YMCA on College and Young Street. They had a list of rooms available, so I rented a furnished room nearby on 36 Maitland Street on the second floor. There were two apartment buildings next to each other called the Maitlands. Number 36 was the left one. The room had one window with a view of the adjacent apartment building. I don't remember the sunlight ever shining in the room, and I think the rent for the room was $7 a week. I lived very frugal and ate every night at a Chinese restaurant around the corner from Maitland on Young Street. The average meal cost me 70 cents, and every other weekend I would take the bus back to St. Catharines and enjoy a home-cooked meal. I remember my father always driving me to the bus station with his car on late Sunday afternoon from Albert Street when I had to go back to Toronto. I found a job right away with Panda Photography on nearby Church Street. Their studio was a converted coach house and they were doing a lot of architectural photography. I worked in their dark room. After I had worked there for a month, I was anxious to enlarge some of my own negatives. And I asked if it was okay if I could use the dark room and I also would pay for the paper. So I spent a Saturday in the dark room. Somehow I sensed I had made a wrong move because a week later I was let go and I don't even remember paying for the paper. My next job, again, was in photography. It was with a large commercial photo studio, Pringle and Booth, specializing in catalog photography. I was a studio assistant and drove a little truck to pick up furniture from department stores. Room sets were built in the studio and photographed for ads in magazines and catalogs. I loved the environment and atmosphere of a big photo studio. For some reason, I still had these original 8x10 negatives and the 4x5 prints taken by the head photographer of the studio. These shots were taken to test the strobe lights, 
and it gave me a chance to pose and pretend to be an actor. On a Friday afternoon, after I had worked there for about three months, I was called into Harvey Morris's office and without any warning told, we have to let you go. He never gave me a reason. I was devastated, almost shell-shocked. I don't remember what I did wrong. Maybe the big boss, who I'd never met formally, didn't like me, didn't like the look of me. Who knows? But up to now, this was the best job I ever had. It was a learning experience for me. Just wasn't savvy enough yet how I presented myself to other people. Again, I found a job in the photography field with Argus cameras in December of 1957 as a service department trainee. They made slide viewers and also made the well-known C3 35 millimeter rangefinder camera nicknamed The Brick, and finally discontinued in 1966. Later in March of 1958, I was promoted to a sales order clerk. I hated this job, but it was the only one I could find with my limited resources and zero connections. I looked at the newspaper every day, looking for a better job. I knew that working at Argus was only temporary and that the future could only be better. I was still interested in film and always would buy the British magazine Sight and Sound and kept seeing these ads for the London School of Film Technique, which was obviously in London, England. I was intrigued especially by the practical aspects of handling and shooting with film cameras and applied in May of 1958 and got accepted to start on the 1st of September. I had saved enough money to at least pay for the first term, which was four months long, and that included living expenses. I was still concerned about having enough money to live on in London, and the school wrote me back that I could find part-time employment in coffee bars, etc. I had lived on Maitland Street for almost a year, and I was eager to leave Toronto. I had made no friends, hadn't joined any groups, had the feeling of just passing through. I consider myself a lonely outsider. I don't remember what I did during the evening hours uh, after I came home from work. I, I probably took a nap, went out, ate, went to a bookstore. But what really is a blank to me is what I did in the morning. Did I have breakfast there? Did I make coffee? Did I prepare lunch? None of that I can remember. One thing I do remember, though, is that I went to a live taping of the Wayne & Schuster comedy TV show as a member of the studio audience. And I remember the heat from the lights of the TV studio. My father came to Toronto to help me move my stuff out of my room. It was the only time he visited me in Toronto. I offered him a Chinese lunch, but he preferred to eat the two bananas he had brought. Amazingly, the old Maitland apartment buildings are still there, just as I left them 57 years ago, surrounded now by newly built high-rise apartment buildings. I booked passage with the Holland America line on the boat the Grote Beer, translated as the Big Dipper, a sister ship of the Waterman. That was the boat that we had taken six years ago when we emigrated to Canada. My dad and sister took me to the train station in St. Catharines. It was awkward to say goodbye, but the future looked bright, especially going to film school in London. The train went from St. Catharines to Union Station in Toronto, then the long train ride during the night to Montreal.
followed by the boat sailing through the St. Lawrence River and Gulf and the Cabot Strait and entering the North Atlantic for the voyage to Rotterdam. When I arrived in Holland, I first visited and stayed with my maternal grandmother, Beppe Frauke Farewijk. I hadn't seen her in six years. She was living with her son, Sala Knoop, and his family in Ter Apel, a town in the province of Groningen. Then, by bicycle up to the Wilp, where I got reacquainted with Pake, my father's father, and Beppe, my grandmother. I took this photo from the inside of the small shed where they kept rabbits. Both were in their mid-80s and in remarkable health and spirit. I also met my two cousins, named after my grandfather, just like I was. This is Pete from Uncle Wietze. And here I am shaking hands with Pete from Uncle Jan Hoving. After a three-week stay in Holland, I traveled by train and ferry across the North Sea to Harwich, England. Took the train there and arrived at Liverpool Station on the east side of London. The film school was located in South London in Brixton on 33 Electric Avenue, in a slum area next to an open air market. And from the school's offices, you could hear the trains roar by. I wasn't impressed with the school location, and when I asked the director where the film cameras were, he showed me instead a few cigar boxes literally taped together. We use them as a framing device, he said. I realized that their advertising was far rosier than the reality, that their ads were almost fraudulent, and decided not to waste my hard-earned savings and not to go to school there. I saw no reason to stay in London, and after seeing some of the famous sights for a few days, returned to Holland. Here I am at a crossroad again. The London School of Film Technique hadn't worked out, and the question was, what am I gonna do next? As luck would have it, a film school was getting started in Amsterdam, known as the Netherlands Film Academy, with two courses of study, screenwriting, and the study of film business. It wasn't a hands-on film school, mostly theory and lectures, but the tuition was only 175 guilders for five months. My Canadian dollars were converted to guilders at a great exchange rate, one dollar to three guilders and 80 cents. I applied to the school and got accepted. We kunnen u tot ons genoegen meedelen that we u graag als cursist hebben ingeschreven. We can share with you the pleasure that we have registered you as a student. The school will start on October 20th. School days are on Monday during the day and in the evening, Tuesday and Wednesday. On December 20th, close for Christmas vacation and reopen on January 5th to March 14, 1959. In April 2012, I visited Amsterdam once again and immersed myself in nostalgia for a day. Here, starting from the Central Railroad Station, I followed the very familiar walking route to the school and the place where I used to live. Here's a photo I took 56 years ago with a view of the Munt Tower from the Kalvestraat. The people are lined up to see a popular Dutch film, Fanfare, in the Roxy movie theater. Oh, here we have a gewoond, 40 years ago. The gewoond torch. Yeah. The film school was located behind the Hotel de l'Europe on the new Doelenstraat.
I'm not sure of the exact address. Was it 12 and 14, 16, or was it 18? Afterwards, I learned that the correct address was New Wadulenstraat 628. A little further down from the school is the New Spiegelstraat Bridge, which crosses over the Kaisersgracht. Here I lived for five months in the left narrow house with the step gables on top. The exact address was 535 Kaisersgracht. I didn't want to rent a room again and eat out every night like I did in Toronto. That's why I had room and board with the Vestra family. I believe I paid 25 guilders a week. My bedroom was on the third floor where the windows are. No, I think it was on the top floor behind the shut window. A block away west is the Leitzestraat, which leads to the spacious lights of Plein. This building is the Stad Schalburg, the city theater of Amsterdam. And it was in this theater 56 years ago that the Nederlandse Comédie opened a play called Danton's Death. The play was about the French Revolution and about Robespierre and Danton, who during the reign of terror both lost their heads under the guillotine. This is me wearing a wig in professional makeup and costume. Fifteen other stage extras and I are playing Parisian citizens. We had no spoken lines, only shouts, and we danced in circles and were used as a backdrop for the main actress. It was a great experience working in a professional theater company. We even toured to other provincial Dutch cities with this play. December of 1958 in Amsterdam was dark, gray, and dreary. And I remember the sun not shining for most of the month. I did roam the streets of Amsterdam, shooting with my Rolleiflex camera, especially the flea market on the Waterloo Plain. Here's my favorite photo, almost a still life of a house facade. And who is that mysterious person behind the door? Was he a ghost? It's March 1959. I'm turning 21 years old and took these self-portraits to celebrate the event. I didn't do well in my film school exams, and the school didn't want me back for their second year. It had all been so academic, no practical hands-on work, not even writing a screenplay. Luckily, I had lived on my savings, and now had no reason to stay in Amsterdam, so I moved north and stayed with my grandparents in the Vilp. My father, riding his bike here, had a friend, Broer Feinstra, who had a job as an upholsterer when he was living in Drachten. He now lived with his family in Losdeinen, a village outside The Hague. Broer was in charge of an upholsterer shop in the psychiatric hospital Blumendal, employing and teaching the patients of the institution. Through him, I got a job as an orderly in the institution. They gave me a white coat to wear, and I was now in charge of a bunch of men with psychiatric problems, some more severe than others. 
It was a summer job, and after six weeks I left, realizing that I didn't want to make this work a career. I was now ready to return to Canada. Through Brufeinstra, I met Maike Slager. She was the same age that I was, and also hailed from Friesland. She worked at the institution as an occupational therapist. We didn't like each other at first, but in the last week of my stay in Holland, we became friends and promised we would write to each other. Again, I traveled with the Holland America Line on the now familiar ship, the Grote Beer. One-way ticket cost $177, or 675 guilders. Brufeinstra and Maike drove on his motorcycle from Losdeinen to Hoek van Holland, and Maike took this photo of the ship starting its lonely voyage across the North Atlantic. I arrived in New York and disembarked in Hoboken. My father was there to pick me up. I hadn't seen him in a year. We embraced, and there were tears in his eyes. My parents had emigrated from Canada to the United States that spring while I was in Holland. And they were now living in an old farmhouse in Quinnebog, a small town in the northeast corner of Connecticut, next to the Massachusetts border. My father was now working in nearby North Grovendale for a company called Jensrism, a maker of wooden office furniture. I was still a resident of Canada and returned to Toronto, a city that I didn't think I ever would go back to, and found an office job with an insurance company sorting out claim papers and found room and board with a Dutch family near Bloor Street. It was only a temporary stay for I had applied a year earlier for emigration to the United States, and my parents were my sponsor. So on October 30th, 1959, I entered the United States by Greyhound bus traveling through Buffalo as an official immigrant. My destination was Quinnebog, back to my parents. I was out of money, and quickly found a job in Southbridge with the American Optical Company. I became a gold assayer, melting down parts of frames of eyeglasses to determine how much gold there was in the frames. My life now was a repetition of my past, living with my parents again and working in a factory and hoping to go to an art school or college someday and saving money to be able to do it. I applied to Cooper Union, a private college in New York City, specializing in science and art. They were offering full tuition scholarships. I took the SAT tests in nearby Worcester, Mass. And after a month of waiting, I learned that I wasn't accepted. In my summer vacation, at American Optical, I went to New York City, stayed at the YMCA Sloan Hotel on West 34th Street and 8th Avenue, and visited the Art Student League, a place on my list to go and study drawing and painting someday. The Van der Waltz visited our farmhouse in Quinnebog when the big barn was still standing. It brought back that old connection to Niagara-on-the-Lake in 1952 when I lived with them for three months. The only bright part of my life in Quinnebog was corresponding with Maike Slager, the Frisian girl I had met in my last week in Holland. We faithfully wrote each other every other week. After immigrating to the United States, we had to register with a local draft board within six months of arrival. I did and promptly was ordered in November for a physical exam, somewhere in Connecticut. To avoid being drafted in the United States Army, I immediately booked passage on a Holland America line boat out of New York to go back to Holland.
It had been 15 months since I had left Holland, and I'm now back again. Maike was waiting for me in Rotterdam when I got off the boat, and it was wonderful to see her. We had written letters to each other for more than a year and knew each other well and now continued our friendship in real life. The first weekend after my arrival in Holland, she took me to northern Friesland, to a small village called Marham, to meet her family. They lived in a small house in the Tiepelsteeg in the center of the village. Maike was from a family of eight. It was a friendly, accommodating family, and I was readily accepted as a new member. Since Maike lived in Loosdijnen, I looked for a room close by in Den Haag, the English name The Hague. Schravenhagen is the historic name still being used today. I rented a spacious and sunny room in a third floor apartment on 119 Vondelstraat. The Vondelstraat was very close to the center of The Hague, where all the government buildings were located. Bordering the Hofvijver were the first and second chambers and the Maritzhuis Museum. During the day, I took drawing classes at the Free Academy. I had bought a used bicycle to get around in the city, and most evenings I would bicycle to Lusdijnen to see Maike. The period of my life of being alone came to an end. I now had a girlfriend to whom I grew closer to each day. This beautiful building is the Koninklijke Schouwburg, the Royal Theater, where Mike and I went quite often to see plays. I even made a drawing of the inside of the theater. The curtain has the following message on it, printed in Old Dutch. Elk die hier zit, bedenken dit, is onraad daar, dreigt soms gevaar, Calm het huis verlaat, gij zijt op straat. Everyone that sits here, bear in mind, if there's trouble or danger, leave the theater calmly, you're now on the street. When I went to film school in Amsterdam, I had applied for a job as a cameraman with the Nederlandse Televisie Stichting, the Netherlands Television Foundation. They wrote back, in antwoord op uw sollicitatie naar de functie van cameraman. In answer to your application for the job of cameraman, we regret to inform you that we cannot consider you for this job. And thank you for your trouble. Respectfully, Netherlands Television Foundation. This time, two years later, I applied again. And persistence paid off, and they were now interested in me, and they invited me to come to Bussum a one and a half hour train ride away from The Hague. After my interview with the three officials in Bussum, I realized that I had to show photos and told them I would do so. I was thinking of doing some sort of photo essay. The Passage, an elegant indoor shopping mall, seemed a suitable subject to photograph and was located in the heart of The Hague. I took a lot of photos inside the mall. Had the two and a quarter negatives developed and printed at a local photo shop and pasted the prints on eight by 10 sheets of paper in a storyboard format. We've written instructions such as dolly into girl for close up, 
Camera pans to the right. Camera tilt up. My interview in Bussem had been on a Monday, and it was now Friday when I personally delivered the film script to a Mr. van der Kolk in Hilversum. He felt that I was too ambitious and that my letters were a little conceited, that I knew more than they did. He said, hardlopers zijn doodlopers, meaning fast runners are deaf runners. He nevertheless kept my script to show to the other officials and, ik zou spoedig van hem horen, I would soon hear from him. To make sure I was in good health, and maybe even to check whether I was quick in my reflexes, the NTS asked me to report on February 24 at the Air Force Medical Center in Soesterberg, a town between Utrecht and Amersfoort. Here I got a complete physical checkup, and they were even testing my reactions to light and sound stimulation. Quite intense. The same one given to Air Force pilots. And I remember it took all day. Ten days later, on March 7th, I got a telegram with the exciting news that I got a job in Dutch television as a cameraman. U bent aangesteld per 8th of March 61. You have been appointed as of the 8th of March 1961 and show up at 9.15 the next day in Hilversum. I telephoned Maike with the good news and later that afternoon she visited me on the Vondelstraat. She was ready to quit her job tomorrow and moved to Hilversum with me. I think that my photo essay on the Passage, the indoor mall, was the clincher in getting the cameraman's job. Maike had come by bicycle, so I accompanied her back to Los Dynan that evening. A last goodbye kiss, and I bicycled back to The Hague, about to start a new adventure. Hilversum was the center of the broadcasting industry in Holland. Conveniently located inside the triangle of Amsterdam, Utrecht, and Amersfoort. The town of Bussum, above Hilversum, was the place where the main studio building was located. The name of the studio was Studio Vitus, named after the St. Vitus Church located nearby. Notice the traffic sign, Stilte TV Studio, Quiet TV Studio. And in the background, you can see a big truck where they're unloading sets for a dramatic production. A top view inside the main studio. Notice the many sound baffles hanging down and the big camera dolly on the floor. The cover of a sugar packet in their cafeteria was beautifully designed. And on the schedule of March 13 to 19, my name was already on the roster. I didn't do much in the first few months, mostly holding a cable for other cameramen, but got an overview of what the programs were like that I would be working on, if I ever was allowed behind the camera. I rented a room in Hilversum on Holland Salon 12. Maike didn't like her job at Blumendal. She had worked there for five years and was very anxious to join me in Hilversum. The next step in my career as a cameraman was being a dolly pusher. All the shows that we were working on were broadcast live, or put on film for broadcast later. So it was a very exciting job. You made sure you didn't make any mistakes. That live element of working in television was like a theater performance without an audience. During the rehearsals, we made many notes that guided us during the broadcast. 
Snelheid means move back fast on Mark of Jov van Post. In September of 1961, Maike and I went on vacation to Paris. We stayed in a hotel on Rue des Ecoles, conveniently located near Boulevard Saint-Germain, the Seine River, and Notre Dame Cathedral. It was just fantastic to roam the areas where famous painters like Vincent van Gogh and Maurice Utrillo had lived and painted. Here's a notice in Frisian, in the newspaper Fries Dagblad by Maike's parents, of her upcoming marriage on December 1st, 1961. The church service at 3 o'clock in Madame and a reception afterwards. Here in the beautiful city hall of Hilversum, we got married on December 1st at 9 o'clock in the morning in a short civil ceremony. Micah's oldest sister, Kos, and our friend Jan Elsenaar were there as witnesses. And our good friend, Mathieu Rochmans, took photos. Micah looked very beautiful and very elegant that day. Our friend Mathieu Rochmans lived nearby. He also worked in Dutch television, first as a cameraman like me, and later on graduated to being a floor manager and director. He owned a small sailboat called the Comet, and I spent a lot of time sailing with him on the Loosrechtse Plassen, a lovely group of lakes outside Hilversum. I also worked in a small studio in Bussum, shooting the on-air announcer for that evening's program. There was no floor manager, so I had to cue the announcer, adjust the lighting, and also shoot the weatherman and his forecast for the next day. Morgen koude nacht, tomorrow cold night. I spent New Year's Eve, 1961, in the little studio and you can see all the drinks and snacks on the table to celebrate the new year of 1962. 
The NTS had five camera crews, and I was now working in Ari von Diermann's camera team. I was now becoming much more experienced as a cameraman, and I enjoyed working on a great variety of television shows, from ballet to amusement, from drama to game shows. On June 29, I told the Dutch television personnel office that I would be leaving and move to the United States. Both Micah and I felt that we were still adventurous enough to want to move to the United States. We hadn't settled in yet, so we could still leave the familiar behind. Two other important reasons for leaving Holland were that my immigrant's visa to the United States would expire that fall, and if I stayed in Holland, and wanted to return to the United States later, I would have to emigrate again with all the hassle of paperwork and finding a sponsor. And reason number two, to avoid the military service in Holland, I did not register at the local city hall, which you're required to do by law, and I lived there for almost two years. If we had stayed, I would finally have to register and probably get drafted right away. Two and a half years in the military is a long time when you're 24 years old. My last day of working for Dutch television was on September 1st. I had worked there for 18 months, that's one and a half years. The boat to New York left on September 24, 1962. So that gave us three weeks of time to say goodbye to our friends, family, and my grandparents in the Vilbe. 